had a great weekend. I know the weather here in Rochester was really nice. So I hope you got outside, got to catch some vitamin D. One of the things that I have been made aware of, so I did um, get an email about the quizzes, which I didn't make the quiz available, but apparently I also did not make homework set five, the Dropbox for that available. So I have extended the deadline for that to Wednesday as well, instead of today. So the homework will be due Wednesday. Make sure when you're doing this, because uh, the homework for week six has also been opened. So make sure you put your homework in the right place. So week five, submit for week five. Also for quizzes, you should now be able to see quiz five, which will be due again by Wednesday. And then quiz six, which starts our look at the second law, which will begin today. So that won't be due till um, the 28th. So does anybody have questions about quizzes or assignments for this week? Perfect. So the other thing that I spent time doing this weekend was grading exams. So hopefully everyone has seen the results for the exams. The first thing that I would like to say is I'm very pleased with the results. I think generally people did a really good job on this exam. Typically, a first thermal midterm is kind of for a lot of people um, the most disheartening part of this class and we get a average back on the first midterm in sort of the mid to high 60s so we're about 15 percent higher than we normally would be my guess is this is in part because of the excellent group of students that we have uh, and probably also in part due to the time that you were given to complete the exam so I'm very happy with the results that we have here. I will not be um, curving exams like we often do in this class because I think that the grades are reasonable where they are. As always, at the end of the class, I'll take a look at letter grades and where we are. And this may not be the case for the midterm or the final, the second midterm or the final, but at least for this first midterm, um, we seem to have delivered, you seem to have delivered a result that was uh, that's much better than what we normally see. So I think that's um, a really good sign. I think it shows that people are engaged in the material, even though I know that this is kind of an atypical way to deliver the material, but I think you're doing, uh, in general, a very good job. So thank you for that. I think it's, uh, you know, it's worth patting yourself on the back. All right, so oh, I guess before we get started, does anybody have any questions about the midterm? I have posted just maybe half an hour ago, I posted under the same place where there were exam materials, so things like the equation sheet. So I think in content, there's a tab called uh, online exam materials. I have posted the solutions to all the multiple choice questions and to the long answer problems as well. So if you'd like to have a look at those, uh, you're welcome to do so. I also had a question in office hours today about accessing the multiple choice questions. So I had a student that said, that they were not able to see their own responses from the multiple choice questions. So I'm looking into that as well. If there's something in the settings for the multiple choice that uh, I can change so that people can see that. I would like for you to be able to see the responses that you gave to the midterms, just like you can see the responses to the quizzes. So with that, does anyone have questions about the midterm? Okay, um, just uh, again, so for those people, I know that I said that, uh, you know, the average is higher than it normally would be, but we will still, as written in the syllabus, um, you still have the option, and uh, I'll just calculate it three, your grade three ways and take the higher one. But um, it's my opinion that what you know at the end of week, uh, well, I guess in this case, what is week 12 is more important than what you know at the end of week four. So you will have the opportunity for your final grade to overwrite one of your midterms if your final grade is higher. So as written in the syllabus, I will calculate your grade three different ways and take whatever grade is highest. You don't need to send me an email to uh, elect which grading scheme you like. I will maximize everyone's grade through the three different grading schemes. So 
we've been spending our time, I guess all the way up until this point in thermodynamics, we've been really sort of driving towards how do we solve thermodynamic processes, right? And I've been saying, oh, they're like Lego blocks and we can put these Lego blocks together to make cycles, right? So cycles where the last, the, you know, the exit state of our final process is the same as the inlet state of our first process. And if we can do that, then we can start to understand how lots of complicated uh, engineering tools. In this class, we're interested a lot in um, heat engines. So how can we use our knowledge of sort of the universe to try to understand how to make these heat engines work better, right? And we've been focused on these uh, analysis methods, how to find, how to solve thermodynamically individual processes. Right. And in particular for open systems in the last week or so, I've been arguing that, you know, for open systems, the things we need to do, number one, where do we draw the control volume? Number two, what happens to the mass? And number three, what happens to the energy? And if we can do these things for open systems, we'll be in pretty good shape. Right. Because we need to know what happens to the mass because every bit of mass that enters carries some energy with it, which might be different a different amount of energy than every bit of mass that leaves our control volume in the same instant, right? So we need to know what happens to the mass before we can figure out what happens to the energy. And this is true. And this three-step process is a good process when you're doing something like, so let's say you work at a nuclear power plant and your supervisor asks you to go run a thermodynamic analysis on a turbine to see if it's performing up to spec, to see if its efficiency is, um, is as quoted, right? So in that case, you're looking at an existing piece of equipment that's operating in real life. So you don't have to ask yourself, is it possible for this thing to run in the universe? Because you know that it's operating in the universe because you're looking at it, right? But that's not always true because sometimes as engineers, we're designing things. Sometimes we're designing things from scratch and we've done some mass, some math, and we've seen that, oh, I can conserve energy, I can conserve mass, but I don't necessarily know that the thing that I'm trying to create is possible if I haven't actually made it in real life. Right, so let's do this bit of a thought exercise to let us look at conservation of mass and conservation of energy and how these two equations might not be enough. So I really like camping. Camping is a fun thing that we like to do. We actually have a camping trip for our family planned in mid-August. We like to usually go away for about a week, um, sort of, you know, turn off all the phones and all the internet and everything and just get out with our family. I like to go with my in-laws, which my wife's parents are awesome. Uh, unfortunately, all of my family, all my extended family lives in Canada. And right now the border's shut down um, and probably for the foreseeable future. So I don't know that we'll get the chance to have that camping trip this year. But if we did, we would burn some wood, right? We'd have a campfire because that's what you do when you're camping, right? So from a thermodynamic perspective, we could draw a control volume around our campfire. Now what happens is we start to burn the wood. Now when we burn the wood, there's a couple things that happen from a thermodynamic perspective. So we get soot and ash and things that are leaving our control volume. So there's some amount of mass that goes out. And then we also, the fire, right, our system here is losing heat. So it's losing heat by radiation, right? So there's some, you know, you'll learn about this more in heat transfer, but if you have something that exists at some temperature, it's radiating heat, right? This is why, you know, we have a fireplace in our house, so sometimes we have a, uh, we, we have fires inside. And my, my 10 year old, she loves to sit right in front of the fire. And that makes it so, um, Nobody else gets the radiant heat from the fire because you can't see the fire. And if you can't see something, then you lose the rate. You don't get, get that radiant heat, right? So we lose some radiant heat from the fire, but we also lose some convective heat, which means we heat up the air and that hot air is moving away, right? So we're losing heat, right? And everybody knows that this is possible in the universe, right? Or at least hopefully, if you don't know that, if you've not experienced a campfire, then you'll sort of uh, come along with me on this journey and I'll tell you that this is something that can happen in the universe, right? We're conserving mass and we're conserving energy, right? So we're breaking down the chemical bonds in the wood 
right? And that gives us some fire or some heat. Now, can I run this process in reverse? Can I take, after my fire has died down, can I take the ashes, add all the mass that left, right? So maybe I do this in a controlled way and I get all the smoke and all the ash and I put it back in my control volume and I figure out how much heat we lost and I put it back into my control volume. And then if I do that, do I get logs of wood back, right? Or another way, I know matches um, are kind of an old school technology, right? But this is also something you use when you're camping, right? So you got a match and it's got that, uh, that end, right? And you strike, the, you strike it on the box and it burns, right? But after the match burns, I can't take that match and unstrike it and get a match stick back. Right, so this is a process where even if I conserve the heat, and so if I conserve the energy and the mass, I don't come back to my initial conditions. There's a natural direction that this process wants to run in. Right, so even though the first law would say that both of these processes, burning the wood and unburning the wood, right, or striking the match and unstriking the match, the first law doesn't tell you that unstriking a match is not possible, right? So we need some other equation, some other rule to tell us what's the natural direction that particular processes run in. And that equation or that rule in thermodynamics we call the second law of thermodynamics. So the first law is conservation of energy and the second law is gonna tell us something about whether or not a particular process is possible or whether or not a particular process can happen in the universe right now the second law is kind of based empirically we don't that means uh we figured it out by experiment right so as scientists and engineers we've been watching the universe for a long time right a reasonably long time at least compared to a human life um certainly not compared to the time that the universe has been around right but we've observed the second law to always be true. We don't know that it would always be true every time, but everything we've seen tells us that the second law is true, right? And the second law is gonna tell us what's this natural direction of a process. So am I striking a match or am I unstriking a match? So this is uh, lecture 18, and we're talking about the second law of thermodynamics. Right, so now sometimes you might think about this as why you can't have a perpetual motion machine. So why you can't sort of get on your bike, pedal it once, and then just coast forever, right? Or, in the words of the Rolling Stones, why you can't always get what you want. So the second law requires us to have a new type of property to look at. Right? And you may have heard this word before, and you may have seen it in the textbook too, right? Because you know we started off just looking at specific internal energy, and then we looked at the open first law. So we started to see, oh, well, we need this enthalpy term too, right? Which is really specific internal energy plus pressure times specific volume. But then now there's this other thing, right? Little s, right? Entropy. Specific entropy if it's little s, right? So what entropy is, is confusing, right? So this is not a thing, you know, mass I think is easy to conceptualize, right? We got this cup that's sitting outside and water's coming in or water's going out. I can picture that. Energy, at least I have some kind of an intuitive feel for, right? Whether I'm charging something up or I'm discharging something. Entropy is, is a whole other beast and, uh, and it gets to be a little bit confusing, right? So here, if I look up in the textbook, what is entropy, it might tell me that in any natural process, there exists an inherent tendency towards the dissipation of useful energy. And this is a lot of words, right? And it sounds nice and scientific, right? But it also, I mean, doesn't exactly tell me what entropy is. Sometimes people will say that entropy is uh, randomness, right? And they'll talk about this idea that... Uh, if you don't clean your room, your room just tend to, has a tendency to get more and more messy. Um, and that's certainly true of my room or my desk at work, 
but I don't think that's my, again, my favorite sort of way to picture this second law is not talk about a room getting more messy. It's to talk about this idea of unstriking a match. So are we, are we doing something that's um, possible or not, right? So entropy is something to do with this dissipation of useful energy, right? And I've kind of alluded to this before, right? So there's this tendency towards dissipation of useful energy. And I talked about how um, the universe is a little bit like a bank, right? Except that in the universe, the kind of trans transactions that we're doing are not monetary transactions. We're exchanging one type of energy for another type of energy, right? So as mechanical engineers, we're often trading in heat energy for work energy, right? And that's where the root, the name thermodynamics even comes from, right? So what happens is every time we make one of these energy transactions, it's like the universe takes a cut, right? Or there's some service fee, right? So um, what it is, is that, you know, if, if you have a pendulum and it's swinging, right? You pull it back and you let it go and you let it just tick tock, tick tock, keep going, right? Eventually, it's going to damp its way out, right? Because there's friction in the system so that um, every, the amplitude of each sort of success, successive period is smaller and smaller and smaller until your pendulum is not moving again. That's why my, my grandparents used to have this uh, cute little cuckoo clock that they had on the wall, and it was powered by these, uh, you know, a little bird would come out and say, like, you know, chirp and whatever, and it had these weights on it that were shaped like pine cones, right? And the purpose of the weights was to keep, you know, to, there was stored energy so that, uh, you know, you wouldn't have to wind it as often. Right, so that uh, potential energy helped power the system because we were always dissipating energy. Right, so entropy on some level is this measure of disorder or randomness in a system. Right, and somehow it captures the idea of losses in the system to things like friction. Right, so the big difference I think between entropy and the other things we've looked at, like mass and energy, is that entropy is not conserved. So we know about conservation of energy and we know about conservation of mass. The second law tells us what happens to entropy, right? But entropy is not conserved. The entropy in the universe is always increasing. So it's like the universe is a bank, right? And it takes a cut from each one of these energy transactions and each time it takes a cut, it increases the entropy in the universe, right? Now, part of the reason that I don't like the idea of calling this randomness is that um, I think maybe before, right? So I'm not like a, um, a physicist, right? So maybe, maybe I'm stepping out uh, of my area of expertise a little bit here. But my understanding was at one point, people used to think that, that the end of the universe happens in what they called heat death, where all the mass had been converted into energy, and eventually you just have uh, the universe as this one big empty space that exists at a particular temperature, right? Now, it sounds to me like that's not randomness, that's like perfect order. But as humans, right, sometimes we are the randomness, right? Um, and we, I would absolutely not want that to be the state of the universe because then there's no humans in it, right? So um, I, I never really like the idea of calling this randomness, but um, oftentimes you'll see that in textbooks and, and on uh, multiple choice questions and things, right? So we have this thing, it's called entropy. It somehow captures the losses in the system. We know that it's not conserved, that it's always increasing, which seems a little bit weird Right, like how can you have this thing that's always increasing in the universe? Um, I read, I think probably when I was close to your age, either when I was in at the end of high school or the beginning of undergraduate, I read uh, Stephen Hawking's A Brief, Brief History of Time. And I won't pretend to tell you that I understood it, but one of the things that helped me think about this particular idea was he kind of made an analogy between entropy and time. So that as time is always increasing, so is entropy, 
So time is another thing in the universe that's always increasing with time. So, you know, maybe this is not a crazy idea that entropy is always increasing in the universe. The units of this thing that we're calling entropy are in kilojoules per degree Kelvin. Or on the textbook, if we take specific entropy, right, this is the intensive version of the property, that's kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So we take big S and we divide it by the mass and we get kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So what's the second law? So the second law of thermodynamics tells us that the total entropy of the universe can never decrease. And I got a bit of a story about this too because the first time that I taught this class, this is the very first class that I taught when I started at RIT. And I was like, this is great. I love thermodynamics, right? So I, I told you probably at the beginning that this class kind of has a bimodal distribution. There's two peaks. There's a lot of people that really love thermodynamics. I think there's a lot of people that really dislike thermodynamics. I don't know how many people there are in the middle, right? So um, I was one of the people that really liked thermodynamics. But when I was going to teach this, I told my brother, who's a biochemist, I was like, oh, you know, I really like the idea of teaching this class, but I'm a little bit scared about introducing the idea of entropy because entropy is like super confusing, right? Um, but the one thing that I know about entropy is that entropy always increases. And my brother, who's a biochemist, he said, well, that's not true, right? Because he knows about different kind of reactions and things. And he's like, well, what about a condensation reaction? Right, so that's something where you take steam, right? You cool it down, it turns back into water, and then the entropy of the water in that case decreases. And what I told my brother was, oh, oh, this is a, this is a really good point, right? But the problem is you got to widen your lens a little bit, right? You got to look at a bigger control volume because I wasn't being precise enough in my speech when I was talking here because the truth is it's the entropy of the universe that can never decrease. So there are processes, anytime you're cooling something down, you're probably reducing the entropy of that thing, right? So in this example, he's exactly right that as you're condensing water, which is interesting for us in this class, we're going to be decreasing the entropy of the water. The problem is to cool one thing down, you have to heat something else up. So as we're heating that other thing up, then what happens is the amount of entropy that gets generated when that other thing is heating up is actually bigger than the reduction in entropy you see in the water cooling down, right? So it's the entropy of the universe that is always increasing. So even though individual parts of the universe might see decreases in entropy, the universe as a whole, for every energy transaction we do, the entropy increases. And this is exactly why we need an equation for this. Because when we say this in words, it's really hard, I think, to understand exactly what we mean. But don't worry, we'll get to the math, right? Another way of looking this, at this is that every system has losses and we can't have perpetual motion, right? We can't have a pendulum that will swing for an infinite amount of time with the same amplitude, right? You can't have a bike where you pedal once and you just keep going. Matt, I see that you have a question. Yeah, so I understand the part where you said, um, since you're cooling something else down, that heat is just going out into the universe. So that's technically increasing entropy. What about like in a reaction with like, say, an ice pack, where that just naturally like, you know, through chemical reactions, like, uh, takes away heat from the outside? Does that still count as like, uh, somehow giving off entropy? So I don't. And so the answer is yes. I don't know exactly the mechanics in that case. So um, this is exactly when you'd need, so my brother didn't take thermodynamics, he took a class called physical chemistry. So in physical chemistry, they did like the uh, thermodynamics of chemical reactions. So my guess, well not my guess, but the second law requires that in, for that process to actually happen, and we know that it actually happens, that to cool something down and reduce the entropy of something, something else as a result of that action has to increase in entropy more than the reduction in entropy you see. So the answer is yes, but I, I will gladly admit that I don't know enough about the chemistry in that case to say where that increase in the entropy happens. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. So why not, right? 
So in any natural process, there exists an inherent tendency towards the dissipation of useful energy, right? So we talked about this idea of friction, right? But more generally, we call these things, right? So in thermodynamics, the word reversible has a particular meaning, right? So a reversible process would be that pendulum where you pick it up, you let it go, and it comes back exactly to the same height that it had before you let it go, right? This is like, if you ever solve a problem, or maybe you did in high school, right? And you assumed that there was no friction in the problem. If you do that, then you took away the irreversibility, right? So irreversibilities are a way that useful energy is dissipated, right? So we've talked about friction and as mechanical engineers, maybe this is the one we're most familiar with, right? And friction oftentimes gets a bad rap, right? But friction is good sometimes, right? Like without friction, you wouldn't be able to ride a bike, right? Because your tires would just spin endlessly, right? Or a car would be the same thing. So sometimes we make use of friction, even though sometimes we lament the fact that friction exists because we lose lots of energy, like fuel efficiency would be really high if we didn't have uh, friction. But, you know, it's the universe, right? That's this is the hand we've been dealt, right? So electrical resistance is another way that energy is dissipated. So you take the current squared multiplied by the resistance in a material, right? And you get heat losses. You also have, um, irreversibilities and chemical reactions. So again, this is not exactly my forte, but I'd imagine this has to do with breaking certain chemical bonds and then trying to reform them again, that it takes a different amount of energy to sort of reform a chemical bond than to break it. So we can also talk about things called a reversible process, right? Now, the one thing that we absolutely know about reversible processes in a thermodynamic sense Right, so reversible process is a process like that, um, you know, like that pendulum, where it's naturally going to get to its initial state, right? If you do it in reverse, the one thing we know about reversible processes is that they do not exist, right? So reversible is another way of saying an ideal process. So here Austin says the increase occurs within the reaction. It is an endothermic reaction, meaning it absorbs heat from the surroundings, right? So thank you, Austin. Right, so a reversible process is uh, ideal, right? So this is these are kind of synonymous words in thermodynamics. So the reversible process doesn't really exist. You can't have a reversible process in real life. But just because it doesn't exist doesn't mean that it's not a useful way to look at the universe sometimes, right? So the this ideal or reversible process is sometimes the thing that we can aspire to, right? So um, we could get to a place, well, maybe, right? We could get to a place where we minimize all of the irreversibility, right? So this perfectly reversible state would, would be the point that we can, you know, we can asymptotically approach that state. So we can get close to it, but never achieve it, right? So it's like the best case, right? Or the ideal process, right? So a reversible process is the ideal version of that process. So if we have a turbine, for example, right? And the turbine produces a certain amount of power, but if we looked at the ideal turbine, that would tell us what the maximum amount of power that we could produce given the inlet and outlet states would be, right? So it's helpful to know what the ideal is so that we kind of know what we're chasing. Even though we know we're never actually going to reach it, we can see what the maximum possible power would be from that turbine. So how do I compare ideal processes to real processes? So a reversible or ideal process has no irreversibility. That means that it does not generate entropy. Right, so this is an important point, right? So I've told you that entropy generation is always happening with every energy transaction that we do. We're always generating entropy. So the best that we could possibly hope to get, and not even really hope to get it, but the thing that we could hope to approach would be, I don't know why this came up here. So the thing that we could hope to approach, sorry about that, would be this case where there are no irreversibilities, right? So where the entropy generation term was zero. So that'd be the best that we could possibly do. 
And notice that this is not a case where we're reducing the entropy in the universe. We're just trying to get to this point where we're getting perpetual motion, right? Where we put something in and it doesn't dissipate. Not that we put something in and it's growing exponentially, right? But the, um, you know, or even linearly, right? But the, the best we can hope for is to not have these losses, right? In an irreversible or real process, there are reversibilities. And what that means is that entropy generation must be positive, right? Because entropy generating is a sign that there are these things like friction that are increasing the entropy. So how do we account for entropy? When we talked about conservation of mass and we talked about conservation of energy, I talked about how, you know, sometimes the words are not super helpful, that at least in my mind, it's the math, I think, that makes it easier to, um, to understand what's going on, right? So we know that unlike energy, entropy is not conserved. Entropy is always increasing in the universe. So how can we try to figure out for a particular process how much entropy is being created or generated. So this is where we have a mathematical formulation of the second law of thermodynamics. And that's what I'm showing here. That, you know, this looks like the conservation of energy a little bit, right? This is the, the change in the entropy. This is a rate, this is not a rate equa equation. This is a time elapsed equation. So this is how the entropy is changing in my system. It's got something to do with the heat transfer divided by some temperature, plus the amount of entropy that's coming into my system with mass, minus the amount of entropy that's leaving my system with mass, plus this sigma term, right? This term is the entropy generation from the process. So we know for real processes, this term is positive. For an ideal process, this term is zero. So if we have a process that's not generating entropy, it's not that delta S is zero, because I can get that in different ways. If I have a process that's not generating entropy, it's this sigma term that goes to zero, my entropy generation term, right? This is the elapsed time version of this equation. So we'll now go through all the different terms. So the, the first term on the left-hand side is in kilojoules per Kelvin. That's just the unit of capital S. This heat transfer term, heat transfer is in something like kilojoules, energy. Temperature is in Kelvin. This is not a temperature difference. So this has to be an absolute temperature. So this is in the right units, right? If I have mass, that's kilograms. S, so specific entropy is kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. If I multiply these two things, I drop the kilograms and I get kilojoules per Kelvin. That looks good. The same thing happens for the term where entropy is leaving the system with mass. And then I'm left with this entropy generation term in its units must also be kilojoules per Kelvin to make sure that I'm not adding apples to oranges. But what does it mean, right? So this first term, delta big S, is the change in entropy in my control volume over some time interval. Q over T, this is the amount of entropy entering the control volume by heat transfer. So entropy is tricky. It can come in and out of the system by mass, but it can also come in and out of the system by heat transfer. So this is the amount of entropy entering the control volume by heat transfer. We have also some entropy coming into the system with the mass and some other entropy leaving the system with the mass. And then we have this entropy production term, right? Or this entropy generation term. And for real processes, this guy has to be above zero. So entropy is not conserved because of this entropy generation term. So any process that would violate this condition cannot happen in real life, even if it satisfies the first law of thermodynamics. So satisfying the first law of thermodynamics is necessary, but not sufficient for a process to be possible. You must be able to satisfy the first law and the second law. But what does violating this condition mean, right? So if we can't pass this particular test, the second law, then it's something that cannot happen, right? It can't proceed. 
So for a process to occur, the first law and the second law have to be true. And we know for the, for the second law to be true, this term, it can't be negative. It can't even be zero. It has to be positive. So this is nice to have the elapsed time form. But when we deal with open systems, we're typically looking at a snapshot of a process. Right? So we want the instantaneous version or the rate form of this equation. To get to there, we have to take all these terms and divide by delta t and take the limit as delta t approaches zero. And when we do that, we get this equation. Right? So this is the rate form of the equation. On the left-hand side, we have the rate of change in the amount of entropy within the control volume at some instant in time. This is sort of the... Um, analogous thing for entropy when we had my cup out in the rain where the water level was going up right and that uh, change in the height of the water was somehow related to how much mass i was storing in the system the same is true for entropy it's just i don't know how you picture that right but this is telling me how much the entropy stored in my system is changing with time right this term and so i think if people mess this one up they start to think about this term as the entropy generation term, but it's not. It's just basically about how much stuff we've stored in my system. And in this case, the stuff is entropy. Again, we have this heat transfer term, but now it's rate. So now we look at the heat transfer rate, Q dot, divided by some temperature. And we'll talk about that temperature, probably more le next lecture, about how to deal with this heat transfer term. We have some entropy that's entering the system with the mass, some entropy that's leaving the system with the mass, and now we have this entropy generation rate. Right, So this is the rate at which entropy is produced in the control volume. So again, we get to this thing, how do I know if I'm violating the second law? Right, We know for real processes, sigma dot has to be bigger than zero. Sometimes it makes sense to look at an ideal process. In an ideal process, sigma dot is zero. It's not negative, but the best we could ever hope to approach doing would be if sigma dot was equal to zero. And then if we ever do this math and we find that sigma dot is negative, we know that the process cannot happen in the universe. So the trick to the second law is, is this positive? negative or zero. Sometimes you'll get a question on an exam or something and they'll ask, is it possible for this process to proceed? And maybe you don't even have enough information to figure out numerically what sigma dot is. But all you really need to know if the process is going to happen or not is what's the sign of this term. So sometimes you can know whether or not you pass or fail the second law even if you don't have a numerical value for sigma dot. So it's been tough for me when we've been talking about drawing, uh, you know, TV diagrams for turbines because, and for pumps and things, because I know that as of now, we're going to draw these not on TV diagrams, but on TS diagrams. And there's a reason for this. Just like for first law processes, for closed systems, we like to draw processes on PV diagrams because the area under those curves was the work, right? So there was a physical reason why we like to draw those PV diagrams. And there's a physical reason we like to draw TS diagrams, particularly for turbines and pumps. So if I've got my rate equation for a turbine, right, I, I'm going to go through this and think about the assumptions that I would make in this case, right? So if this is an ideal turbine, we're going to start with the system being at steady state. It's going to be one inlet and one outlet, just like in this picture. This is a big sort of... Um, inlet, right? So coming in here, this is all connected, looks like a donut, right? Same with the outlet. So we're going to say uh, one inlet, one outlet, that it's adiabatic, so it's insulated enough that it's not losing heat. And now, because this is an ideal turbine, what ideal or reversible means is that this sigma dot term goes to zero. So for an ideal turbine, what I'm going to find is that zero is equal to m dot times s in minus s out. I did a little bit of trickery here. I've already done conservation of mass in my head here. 
So I know that for a system that's at steady state with one inlet and one outlet, I'm going to get that the inlet mass flow rate is equal to the outlet mass flow rate. So there's really only one mass flow rate here, m dot. So zero is equal to m dot times s in minus s out. And that means if there's something interesting happening, so if the mass flow rate isn't zero, that means that the entropy coming in is equal to the entropy going out. That means that my entropy didn't change as it went through the turbine, even though in the ideal case, the best case scenario, is that the entropy of the fluid moving through my turbine didn't change. For real turbines, it's a little bit different. We're still steady state, still one inlet, one outlet, still adiabatic, but now we know that sigma dot, I don't know what sigma dot is, but it's not zero. So that means that here I have an expression for sigma dot that's equal to m dot times s out minus s in. So I can figure out the value of sigma dot, and if it's ever bigger than zero, that means it's possible. But if it's less than zero, it means it can't happen. And if it's equal to zero, that means it also can't happen, but it's kind of the limit of what we could achieve. So here S out of my turbine must be bigger than S in in my turbine. So if I was going to draw these two things on a TS diagram, right? So my ideal turbine, the outlet state, right? So here I'll call my inlet state one. The ideal outlet state, we have this weird subscript for, right? We call this sometimes the ideal exit or the isentropic exit because we've seen for these turbines, uh, S1 is equal to S2. So S doesn't change. So if something doesn't change its entropy, we call it isentropic, right? So here, 2S, this ideal exit of my turbine, is exactly vertically below 1. So if I'm drawing my ideal turbine on this TS diagram, I have a vertical line down. If I have the real turbine, it's still going to operate between these. I've drawn, drawn some pressure lines. I didn't label them what the pressures are. But I go from this high pressure down to this low pressure, and I know that at S2, my entropy, my specific entropy, has to be bigger than the specific entropy at 1, which is the same as the specific entropy of 2S. So that means my state 2, I don't know exactly where it is, but I know it's got to be on this dashed line to the right of 2S. So my real turbine, the process line goes down and to the right. I can do the same thing with pumps. Remember when we did pumps with the first law, how they were basically the same as turbines? We got similar equations. So here, if we're at steady state, one inlet, one outlet, so the summation signs go away. We're adiabatic, so my Q dot term goes away. If it's an ideal pump, sigma dot is zero. And we get this same thing where S in is equal to S out. Remember before when we were talking about um, we had to, when we did the first law for a pump, we said, well, let's pretend that it's ideal. And I told them we don't really know what ideal means yet, but we'll assume that the temperatures at the inlet and outlet are about the same. And then we sort of got into this idea that uh, delta H for a pump was VDP or V delta P, right? So what we really mean by an ideal pump, now we see is one where S in is equal to S out. In a real pump, just like a real turbine, we'll say that it's at steady state, one inlet, one outlet, no heat transfer, and we have a positive sigma dot. So here we have an equation for sigma dot, and we know it looks just like our equation for the turbine, and we know that S out has to be bigger than S in for this to be positive, right? Because M dot is going to be positive, and S out has to be bigger than S in for this to be a positive number. So if I'm drawing my pump on the other side of the vapor dome, I know that, again, so if this is my inlet state here of my pump, I'd have my outlet pump, which would be 2S. That's the isentropic outlet of the pump or the ideal outlet of the pump. That's a vertical line on this TS diagram. That's why we like drawing these TS diagrams. And then we'll have S increase, right? Still got to be on the same pressure. I'm still operating between the same two pressures. I measured that. Right? So now my 2S is on this high pressure line, but it's jotted over to the right a little bit here. I'm exaggerating this, but now this line goes up and to the right. So that's what an ideal pump looks like.
So now you might have noticed that for us to do this analysis, we needed to assume in both the pump and the turbine that the heat transfer rate was zero. And it's nice when the heat transfer rate is zero because I think mechanically when we're dealing with these equations, it's the heat transfer term that messes people up most of the time. Because we have to think about, well, what's the right sign for Q dot? And then we also have to think about what's the right temperature that we divide by. And we have to think about what's the right unit for that temperature, because it's not a temperature difference. It's just a temperature. And you know, if it's not a temperature difference, it has to be an absolute temperature, like in Kelvin or in Rankine. So you might be asking yourself, well, what happens when Q dot is not equal to zero? And that's a great question. And we'll find out next class what happens when the heat transfer rate's not zero, and how do we deal with that when we're doing this second law type analysis. So next class, we'll start to look at this case I was talking about with my brother, where we're condensing a fluid or we're lowering the temperature. And how does that, um, how, what does that tell us about this entropy generation rate? So that's all that I have for today. I'm happy to take any questions that people have. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I will see you on Wednesday. Remember that the deadline for the for this week's homework, well, for the homework that would have been due today and the quiz that would have been due yesterday, the deadlines for both of those things have been extended to Monday at midnight, wherever you live. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.